Hello, good evening, uh, our viewers, and uh, welcome to our webinar about end SARS protest in uh, in Nigeria. And uh, without much wasting our time, we would like to invite and the director in Nigeria. And uh, without much wasting our time, we would like to invite Dr. Ismail Solemes, the director in the University Center for African Research to present his uh, welcome address. Uh, Hojam, uh, I'm leaving the floor to you, sir. Uh, good evening to everybody. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Dear participants and dear audience, welcome. Thank you. Uh, area, which is among the biggest economies uh, of Africa and is strategically important, uh, has witnessed mass demonstration in recent weeks. That's why we chose our webinar topic this week as the SARS protests in Nigeria. Our webinar program will be handled uh, independently of the Nigerian government and SARS protest, prost, uh, protesters. Our goal is not to blame anyone. Our goal is to understand the events, the protest, to learn the demands of the protesters, to find out their reasons. We want to recognize and define reality for the purpose of academic research with a purely academic Christian. Nigeria is a friendly and fraternal country for us. The peace and happiness of the Nigerian people is extremely important to us. Nigerians are our brothers. For a more peaceful and problem free Nigeria. Finally, I would like to say that as Nigeria's ability to continue its uh, prosperity and economic growth, I believe that its continued leadership as both the leader and backbone of the continent will gain more value. Thank you so much. Salam alaikum. Salam. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ismail Solemes, for your welcome address. And uh, I also welcome you once again uh, to this very wonderful webinar. The focus of our webinar program this week is the end SARS protest against the special anti robbery squad of Nigerian police a unit accused by Nigerians, especially the youths, of human rights violations. We will look at how did the demonstrations begin? How did they separate? Why are the young people angry? Which groups are behind the protest in Nigeria? And who are, the part or who are participating in the demonstrations? How long will it continue in the country? The end SARS protest began on October 8th after a video circulated showing members of the SARS police shooting a man in Nigeria's Delta state. The protest then spread to several Nigerian states. In the early stages of the protest, marches and actions were held peacefully. However, especially in the last few weeks, there have been images shown that actions such as looting, arson of buildings and barricades on the roads have increased. It is not known yet for certain who or which groups are behind the increase of these unfortunate incidents such as looting during the protest, which began peacefully. And it seems like it is now very hard to differentiate between those hoodlums and the well-meaning youths that started the peaceful protest. Then what will be the way forward for the well-meaning youths yearning for many things from Nigerian government? 
Of course, the discussions came at a time when needed most within and outside Nigeria because in almost all the media, be it mainstream or social media, the NSAS protests have attracted much attention globally. We are hoping that our webinar will be very impactful and dynamic, taking into consideration the panelists we have here, who are versatile, quintessential activists, and members of different civil organizations. I'm quite sure our viewers will have what they expect from you. Before we start, I would like to introduce our guest shortly. First, we have Aisha Yusufu. Aisha Yusufu, a Nigerian businesswoman and activist, emerged in 2014 as a leader of the Bring Back Our Girls movement to fight for the return of more than 200 girls abducted by the terrorist group Boko Haram. She is again on the front lines of social protest. She always fights for the goodness of a common or of common Nigerians. We also have Al Qasim Abdul Qadir. Uh, welcome to the program, uh, Ms. Aisha Yusuf. Thank you very much. Uh, we also have Al Qasim Abdul Qadir, communication specialist, technical advisor, communication strategy to the National Commission for Refugees, Migrants, and Internally Displaced Persons, and also founder of Nigeria Numeric. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. We also have Ali Utahiro Aliyu, is a researcher and journalist who formerly worked with Leadership Hausa as a back page columnist. Also worked with Daily Nigerian online popular newspaper as a columnist and as a contributor to BBC Hausa and CNN. He currently works with Home Angle as a special projects editor and program manager. Welcome, Mr. Aliyu. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, also, we have Obugwe Igwegu, a policy analyst at Prepolitica. Igwegu specializes in geopolitics, globalization, Africa China relations. He is frequently quoted in news media and has appeared on Al Jazeera English. CGTN, DW News, and the BBC. And recently, I can see he has been critically digesting Turkish win-win expansion in African countries and the efforts of the country to likely uproot the colonialists from some regions. Welcome, Mr. Igwegu. Thank you for having me. Uh, without much uh, taking our time, uh, I would like to start with Mrs. Uh, Aisha Yusuf about this, uh, the, the NSAS protest. Uh, Aisha Yusuf, why did the protest start? Why has it spread so far and very quickly, within a very short time, almost within the whole country? Who is leading the protest? Uh, thank you so much uh, uh, for, for, for having me. Uh, and thank you also for putting the issue of, this, uh, of end starts on the front burner. Uh, I, I would say, like, like you rightly said, there are, there are immediate and remote causes uh, to all of this uh, protest. Uh, you, okay. you had mentioned earlier uh, the, the video of, uh, of a young man being attacked in Ugeli, in, in, in Delta State of Nigeria. And yeah. uh, his vehicle taking a waste packed, you know, the recent protests that we had. But immediately before then, we had a situation whereby a 20 year old um, a young man was killed in, in, in Patakot, uh, in River State in Nigeria. The thousand, these two states are, states are in the southern part of uh, Nigeria. And uh, okay. so when that happened, and there was this video that went viral of his father actually crying and saying that he spent 12 years in the North. Nothing happened to his children. He came back home and his, and his son has been killed. And what was the reason that his son was killed was because he refused uh, to show his phone. He was asked to open his phone and he said no. And because of that, he got four bullets. So in the midst of doing that, few weeks after the Ugeli one 
started. And that just sort of like sparked at the, at the anger. And there was protest, of course, uh, in, in, in Ugeli, in Delta State, and that seemed to go all over. But when, like I said, there are the immediate causes and also uh, the remote causes. Remote causes coming from the police brutality that has been going, going on for years. There have been several uh, protests, NSAS protests over the years, as far back as 2017. And they, even though not a lot of people came out, because the, the, you know most people really don't bother when it is about protests. They just keep doing their own thing. They don't focus on the main uh, issue. And uh, there have been a lot of calls on the issue of SARS uh, to be disbanded. And since 2017, December, there has been disbandment of, of SARS. 2017, 2018, 2019, and 2020. Uh, ironically, uh, in, in 2018, a panel was set up, and this panel basically what they what it was done was to for the reformation of SARS. And in, okay. in June 2019, they submitted their report to the president, and the president said that we're going to take action immediately. And it's been 16 months, and nothing has happened. So all of this, knowing fully well that. But the recently, the, the, the IGP, the Inspector General of Police, uh, has already dissolved the SARS. But why, why the protest continues after the dissolvement? So that was why I said SARS was dissolved in 2017. It, is, it was dissolved in 2018, 2019, and 2020. At one time, the name was even changed from SARS, which is a special and the robbery code, to EPSAS, which is Federal Special and the robbery code. So all of this has been going on. But the, the, the thing we need to understand is that, like a friend of mine, Flores Ozo, said, she said, the NSAS protest is a protest of survival. It's not like every other protest. For example, the Bring Back Our Girls protest was basically a protest of empathy. I mean, okay. uh, girls were taken away, 276 girls were taken away from their school, and uh, citizens mm -hmm. came out and made the mass. We were empathizing with the parents whose children were taken away. In the case of NSAS protests, most of the protesters are actually victims. They have either been victims, a good number of them multiple times in different states, and then we have some who, for them, they either their families have been uh, have, were victims. Many people have been killed. We are getting reports that from 2004 to date, SAS have uh, killed uh, Nigeria, a judicial killing of over 30,000 people. That's almost but like a terrorist group. More than 30,000 people. More than 30,000 people from From, from where did you get the data, Listen. please? Because the number oh, okay. is very big. The number is so big that it's unbelievable. I don't have the data this in off head, but in the course of the listen, I'll look it up and give you from the, uh, the, the uh, where the study came out from because it's a report that is out there. And even the first time I looked at it, I was like, this is such a large number. And the group that actually, actually did the report had to have their credibility, but I'm gonna, while we are doing that, I will get that for you. So okay. a lot of the, the killings, heinous killings, the, the, the stories that were coming out, and not just all of that, the impunity but, with which SARS operated. Most of them, uh, were allegations against the police. So 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 let me let me let me take you through one. For example, uh, SARS, has, SARS is supposed to be special anti-robbery squad, and then sort of like they turn into robbers themselves. Because what happens when you have a gun? given to you by the state to protect the people, but other than, instead of protecting the people, you actually extort the people. And a lot of people have put it out there, a lot of victims came out with their stories and they even tagged the police to say, so and so of your men have forced me to uh, withdraw so and so amount of money from my account and transferred it to them. And so saying to them, what are you going to do about it? And nothing was done. And even when, like right now, we look at the protests, it seems as if people who have been killed uh, under the cover of darkness came out to say, look, we are being killed. Can you do something about it? Can all of this be stopped? And instead of it to be stopped, what happened? They have been killed more. You said something earlier about uh, uh, so a talk the, the police, about... The police, the police authorities refused to take any action against their, their staff. Absolutely. They haven't taken any action? Uh, a lot of a lot of uh, the police officers that have been indicted in different panels, they are still in the police service. A good number of them have been promoted, and this is what makes me people uh, to have. Uh, why the protesters said they were not going to leave the streets? They wanted to see action. 
why they were protesting, they had uh, they were they were also negotiating. But there's something that I need to correct. A lot of that I hear people say that oh uh, okay. talk uh, yes. talks have Your infiltrated NSAS protesters. I'll round up on this that talks have in infiltrated NSAS protesters or they became violent. No, the NSAS protesters were absolutely peaceful, and we watch why the government brought in police to kill them, attack them, maim them, kill them. Brought okay, in the we, military, we, attack them. We will come back to that. We will come back to okay. that. Uh, thank okay. you for your contributions. Uh, thank you. Mr. Al-Qasim Abdul Qadir. Uh, according to you, who supports the demonstrations, the NSAS demonstrations in Nigeria? Uh, uh, can you hear me, Mr. Moderator? Yes. Oh, okay, then. Uh, well, uh, a cross-section of uh, people support the demonstrations in Nigeria. Uh, first of all, you have people who are progressively minded, people who are of the opinion that Nigerians deserve a better deal, people who are of the opinion that things are not going the way they should go to, people who understand universal values of democracy, people who understand that uh, Nigerians can, can do better than the way they are doing now, that uh, we cannot remain the poverty capital of the world, that uh, we, we, we cannot have our politicians uh, ride roughshod over us, that uh, we cannot be slaves in a country where we collectively call our own. These are all the people that support the protest. People who understand that you cannot have a police force, you cannot have security agents, you know, brutalize citizens on a daily basis without institutional agencies doing anything. People who support the protest are people who know that they need to take back agency from institutions that they've given agency to, that a citizen is the employer of the state and not the other way around. These are the but some, something to be the, to be questioned the about the protest uh, is why is it coming now? Why is it coming under present administration? Why not before? Because uh, Nigerians, as you made mention, uh, have been in such a conditions for a long time. Exactly. Uh, there's a saying in Nigeria that anytime you wake up, it is your morning. So this is the time that Nigerian young people think that they have had it enough. And that's why they have come up to say that this is the tipping point and it will no longer be business as usual. So it's not about President Muhammad Buhari. It's not about uh, former President John Tan. Whoever is in power, Nigerians need to fight the political system. What Nigerians are fighting is a state of misgovernance and not just the current administration. In 2023, when a new president comes, young people will continue to ask for a better country for themselves and unborn generations. Please, people should understand that this is not about President Muhammadu Buhari. This is about fighting years of misgovernance. This is about taking back a country that we all collectively call our own. This is not about the president. Yes, but it seems it seems like uh, people or the protesters concentrate on the federal government alone, forgetting that they have governors, they have uh, federal lawmakers, they have state lawmakers. What is your take on that? It seems like uh, the protesters put all the blame on the federal government. Okay. Uh... You should understand that uh, Nigeria is a federation. There's yes. an enormous power concentrated in the center. So, for example, the military is under the federal government. The police is under the federal government. Uh, NSAS is all about police brutality. The police are still under the Inspector General of Police. The Inspector General of Police is answerable to the president. That's why you see that there's a lot of focus on, on, on the center. But I tell you, with the way things are going, this will distill to the state, this will distill to the local governments, this will distill to the wards. And when you talk of good governance, we are not expecting, all Nigerians are not expecting only the president or his cabinet members to be good, you know, to govern the country. 
uh, rightly to use their money judiciously. No, the governors also receive their monthly allocation from the federal government, the local governments too. You know, the, the parliament members also uh, take their own money for the constituency project. Yes. Yes. Uh, one thing I would like you to understand is that the median age in Nigeria is 18. Uh, democracy is around 21 years old in Nigeria now. A lot of young people are now beginning to learn about the instruments of democracy. Once the populace becomes very educated about the frameworks of how democracy works, they will begin to ask for accountability. They will begin to ask for greater transparency from all the forms of democracy, from all the separation of powers. So when the understanding of civics gets rooted in Nigeria, I can assure you that people will ask the right questions. Okay, thank you, Mr. al -Kassim. We'll come back to you again. Uh, Mr. Aliyu, Tahiru Aliyu, uh, how have Nigerian authorities responded to the protest so far? Hello, can you, can you hear me, okay. Mr. Hear Aliyu? Me right now? Yes. Yes, I can hear Yes, how have Nigerian authorities uh, responded Nigerian to the protest so far? Uh, I think uh, uh, to start with, uh, Nigerian government uh, doesn't have experience with a leaderless, uh, you know, social media uh, organized protest. Uh, and that's why it became very difficult for Nigerian government to understand how to respond to, uh, to the NSAS protest. Uh, uh, you know, actually, the protesters, especially on social media, especially those who are uh, in the diaspora, pressured the government into speaking. Uh, like, uh, in the first place, uh, uh, the IG of police, uh, you know, responded to the protesters by disbanding the SARS, uh, by saying that he dissolved the SARS. And uh, uh, the, the government officials try very hard to see that... Uh, uh, they explain to the people that this dissolving of the that is different from the previous one. There were many times when the federal government was saying uh, it has dissolved the, the SARS or disbanded the SARS, and then it turned out that uh, they really didn't dissolve it. So. So yes, this but time this time, around, the, the SARS, SARS was disbanded and then replaced by another SWAT. It means uh, it has been disbanded now. Yes, but many people think that uh, this SWAT uh, is kind of a, a, an old wine, a, you know, poured into a new bottle. That means it's the same, uh, you know, brutality that was recorded from the SARS would be also recorded from the SWAT. So Nigerian government responded with that, but uh, uh, many protesters didn't feel that uh, that was okay or that will actually solve the issue. And then the, uh, there were many pressure that uh, the president must speak. You know, the president spoke and uh, many people think that it's not actually what they wanted. Then they continued the protest and then the president, you know, spoke again. And uh, even though when you protested, when you spoke again, uh, there were many people saying that what he said was not what he expected, what was expected. Okay, but uh, don't you think uh, uh, when the IGP disbanded uh, the, the SARS, the youth should have retreated back and give a SWAT a trial to see whether the same situation with SARS will continue? Well, actually, you cannot uh, see this movement. Uh, there is no leader in this movement. Only we have influencers who influence the, uh, the movement. But there are no leaders. So nobody can ask the protesters to stop if, if there is this kind of disbandment. Uh, uh, I think, I particularly think that, uh, I, I personally think that uh, the protesters should wait and see what the SWAT should do or what SWAT uh, will do. But uh, yes. since there is no need to ask them to stop, I think there is no one to tell them, uh, you guys should stop and wait for uh, what, what you should, uh, would do. Then without leadership, can the youth achieve what they want from the government? 
you know, based on previous uh, protests, similar similar protests that uh, were organized in different countries, uh, most of these euphoric, you know, leaderless, decentralized online movements actually don't bring the uh, uh, the solution that we were all looking for. Most of the time, because of the lack of leadership, there were no people to, you know, uh, approach when we, uh, when, when a solution to the problem uh, is going to be provided. So I think uh, most of the, uh, this kind of uh, movement uh, end, up, uh, end up without bringing the solution we are all looking for. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Aliyu. Thank you. Mr. Obugwego, uh, what changes do the protests want from the government? Even though some of the discussion uh, talked about them, but we would like to hear your stance about uh, the demands of the protesters in Nigeria. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. We can hear you. Good. Yeah, so kudos to all the earlier speakers. They made very salient points as regards you know, the issue so far. Uh, first of all, let's look at the official demands that was put forward by, you know, by the movement. You know, there are five or five main demands. It starts with you know, uh, immediate release of all you know, protesters that have been arrested. That still hasn't happened because I just read a report today that 520 protesters are still in government custody. You know, because across uh, the, of course, the, the, when someone uh, did something against the state, how can you demand for his immediate release? No, no, but that, that's still contest, contested because you cannot just say because someone is rising up to exercise their democratic rights to you know to you know challenge their government for for misrule automatically that person deserves you know to be punished except you can prove in court that such a protester has damaged you know public property or even private property or, or, or any of that that is where you know what one can say oh the person deserves to be in, in arrested now 520 people still, still, still in custody still haven't be, been released you know and you know uh, the second the demand for justice for all the all the victims you know so people want to see you know, uh, these maligned officers tried before a court for, for them to actually understand that, yes, there is justice. Because when we're talking about justice here, you, it is going to be very difficult for the government to convince the people of Nigeria that it really has the best interests of Nigerians if it cannot bring, up, bring forward the, the perpetrators and then try them before a court, you know, for us you know, to see. And also compensation also because Lives have been lost. I mean, uh, the earlier example, you know, uh, given of the young boy in, the, in Delta State is telling. How could you, you know, ima how would you imagine in your, in your own country, your, gov your government uh, uh, agent, which is the police, state agent, which is the police force, would kill an unarmed, you know, individual and see seize the, the, the person's vehicle? It's ridiculous. You know, it, you, you cannot, it's not, it's not accepted in any way. And even if, uh, uh, you know, uh, police brutality, See, uh, or uh, human rights abuse seems to be rampant across, you know, the global south, particularly in Africa here. We know the standards are particularly low here. Even by African, quote-unquote, African standards, what mm. SARS has done over the years is heinous. You know, you cannot, you can't even compare it to, you know, really weak, weaker uh, countries in terms of a uh, judicial system like, like the Congo. This is terrible. I, and if you, need to, you need to see the shock when people started, all over the uh, continent started hearing what has been going on in, in Nigeria. It, it seems as if it was not something that should be that should be happening in the 21st century. So there's a, the, the, again the, the, we are also saying setting up an independent body to oversee the investigation and prosecution of you know police misconduct. The important point there's there already or the important there is to their their committees. I think almost 30 states out of 36 states constituted their judiciary panels to investigate uh, the Very, alleged. Yeah, of course, yes, we, we, yes. You know, we, 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 we are seeing that these panels are, are being set up, but that, that's just one of, this, of the many, you know, requests that, that, that is being made. What, what about, you know, psychological evaluation, you know, of, 
you know, the, the uh, officials, because now you mentioned SWAT being uh, being the uh, successor of, of SARS. But, uh, you know, like the last speaker said, it's like putting old wine in a new bottle. The, see, you have to understand, the Nigerian police force has a war zone mentality. Because it is only, it's only in the war front that you will just accost an individual and asking the questions, open your, 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 your mobile uh, uh, device, and then the person is resisting, you just shoot the, the person. You know, it, it's almost, it, you, you cannot, you can't, you can't defend that. that that's, it's, so, it's, such, it's such a psychological issue, not just even, because when you say police brutality, in, in my view, I said, no, but, this, this but is police don't criminality. You, don't, don't, you, don't you think uh, it is the inability of Nigerians to, to follow simple, uh, simple instructions from the police led to all these uh, atrocities, as you mentioned? No, 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 no. That, that's, that's, uh, that's not just taking into part. That, that is that is wrong with all due respect. Because if you if you as a you see, this is a democracy, right? Like if we're in North Korea, it's a it's a different thing entirely. This is a democracy. Citizens have rights, and as one of the last speakers says, we are the employer of the police force, right? It is the people that give the, the, the government a constitution. And in that constitution, there's freedom of movement, there's free, there's freedom, in fact. In the shortest provision in Nigerian uh, Constitution 1999, it says governmental action shall be humane. It is what we have seen from the government so far, whether it's in, before the protests or the, the acts that have led to the protests, state agents have been inhumane. And even in the protests, the crackdown is inhumane. So even we, we are not going to just sit back and say, oh, this is uh, citizens not accepting instruction. What instruction, what instruction? That instruction is not, is not consistent in, with democratic values. You cannot tell an individual to open a private property without a warrant from, in, from a court. So the, the phone, I, th I think even in 2018, the, the, the police force actually made it very clear that no police, no police officer has the right to actually order an individual to open their phone because that constitutes you know, a breach of constitutional practice. It is a private yes. property. It's not your car. If it's your car, it's different. Your car is in public, but this is a private property that contains sensitive information that you do not want put out there. So it, we cannot really hide under the veneer of you know, uh, inability okay, to Okay, Mr. Iguego, thank you for your con contribution. Thank you very yeah. much. Uh, yeah. I am back to you again, uh, Aisha Yusufo. Hmm. How long will the protest last? Because this is almost a month, and uh, we can still hear news that uh, even in some Nigerian states, uh, curfews were uh, announced in some states. For how long? When is it going to end? Uh, so be before I go on, I I'm going to talk about uh, the, the figures that I had given you earlier, where I okay. said from 2004 to date, 30,400. Yes, the, the number Nigerian is very big. Killed. Yeah, so hold on, let me give that to you. 30,400 Nigerians have been killed in extrajudicial killings in Nigeria by SARS. And this is a report by the International Society for Civil Liberties and the Rule of Law on their this thing. So that's that's one. Uh, so okay. be before I go on and ask, answer some of your questions, you know, when I was listening to other speakers and some of the questions you were asking, I was actually cringing. I couldn't believe hearing the fact that you said citizens are not obeying simple instructions, and that's the reason why they are being killed. We are citizens in our country. We are not slaves. And there is no how that we can justify in any way whatsoever citizens being killed by the people who are supposed to protect them, and we think it's okay. There is no how citizens will be extorted from, they will be stolen from, using arms, and then we sit down here and say it's okay. It's not okay in any way uh, whatsoever. One of the things I want to talk about, I want to talk about the leadership of NSAT. The fact that it's not the traditional kind of leadership that we are used to, where you have one person in front and people follow, doesn't mean they don't have leadership. If there's any place where there was no leadership, it was shown by the Nigerian government. The NSAT protesters, every one of them is a leader, and everything that came out, they consistently brought out what they were talking about. The, on the 11th of October, when the uh, IG of police brought out what he, what, what he, five things that the dissolution of NSAS made, they immediately brought out their five for five demand. On the 19th of October, they went on again to bring what, what has been done so far and then what the implementation will be like. You talk about this panel. One of the yeah. things that the, the NSAS protesters have asked for now is that there should be, there should be 
uh, the, the governing council of the National Human Rights Commission should be constituted. There is no governing council in the National Human Rights uh, Commission. And it is being said that the executive chairman does not have a right to constitute panels. That at the end of the day, we are fearing, let there not be the legitimacy so, of this panel. Who is responsible for, so, for so, constituting so the panel? It's the president, and he hasn't done that. And so when you talk about when are these protests going to end, I'm going to say yes. that um, the protests are going to end when the Nigerian life is matter. Because right now, Nigerian life doesn't matter. You and I sitting down right now, we could be driving on the streets of Adabuja or streets of Lagos or streets of Kano, and a policeman will come at us and will shoot us and kill us and say nothing will happen. And indeed, nothing will happen. And that is where the main problem is. We must get away from the culture we have in Nigeria where we are blaming the victims rather than blaming the perpetrators. The government hasn't done well. The government has responded with force. The government has killed people. We must ensure that citizens' lives matter. And I say this everywhere. As long as there's one person whose life doesn't matter, all our lives don't matter. Because the situation whereby you see policemen will say to you, they will waste you and nothing will happen. They will kill you and the president will not do anything. And young people come out to make demands that they are being killed. And then they end up being killed again. It's a major problem. Nigerian government should tackle this with intelligence, with compassion, with leadership, with empathy, and know that young people are being killed. These are young people that we did not give them enabling environment for them to thrive. And they have found niches for themselves and they are growing and yet we are killing them. Enough is enough. So it's going to be as, as long as they do not get their demands. Right now, um, our meetings are going on right now. They are having this a conference that they they are planning. They are already in this uh, uh, panels. Why they are still doing this? At the end of the day, let our government, let the Nigerian people understand, and let us all come together and ensure that SARS no longer look at people as uh, as ones that they can kill, but as citizens, not as slaves in their own country. Okay, thank thank you. Very, but something I would like to ask about the leadership of the NSARS. Can we say Aisha Yusuf is one of the leaders? No, you can't. Everyone is a leader and they're all putting things together. And I think, let me just make this clear. COVID-19 has shown, we are in a new world. COVID-19 has shown us that people can actually work from their houses without having to be in the office. At one time, people didn't know that. And so what they do is that they are multitasking. These are young people who are used to technology, who are, used, who are on the brink of uh, uh, machine age. While they are doing their protests, they were also negotiating with government, not only negotiating, giving the government how to implement, giving them what to do now, the short and medium term and the medium and long term. So in case of, in the, in the essence of uh, NSAS, they, they, they don't have leaders. Every one of them is leader. Let me just quickly say this. And I see the point with them. The older generation, I'm part of the older generation, we haven't done them well. They have been betrayed several times to the extent that they have, uh, an aversion to leadership. What normally happens in Nigeria when there's protests like this, the leaders will come and then they will sell out the people. And this time they said, no, every one of them is going to be a leader. Every one of them is going to be a stakeholder and the government should be negotiating with all of them. And they've done that. Right now they have representatives in all of the If, if everyone is a leader, leader. then uh, how can decision, decisions be taken? But decisions are already being taken. So let me give you an example. On the 11th of October, what happened? The idea of police says he has disbanded SARS and brought out five things that it meant. On that 11th of uh, October, uh, there was five for five. They gave the five things that they wanted to, to see happen. Protesters should be, uh, should be all protesters should be released. And you just said something about, oh, if somebody commits a crime. Pro pro protest is not a crime. Protest is constitutionally allowed. It's a way to show your grievance. And they, and they did that. Justice for, okay, the, the five for five has already been mentioned so that I don't belabor us. And then yes. on the 19th, of October, they came out again with their implementation. This is what government needs to do. So they, they, even though you don't see the leadership, that's why I say it's not a traditional kind of leadership we see, but they have leadership and they have been very strategic. They have cohesion. They have had organization. They've been working so well. Sadly, I repeat, it's the Nigerian government that is not showing leadership. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, Mr. Al Qasim Abdul Qadir. Yes. Yes. Uh, did the international community support the protest? Uh, the international 
community are very much invested in what happens in Nigeria. Uh, I would like to give you a background. Countries like uh, European countries like uh, Germany, like Britain, like Spain, are very much invested in what happens in Nigeria. Nigeria with a population of 200 million people. If anything happens in Nigeria, it means that the avalanche and exodus of people that will go out of Nigeria seeking, seeking safety and protection in other countries will almost be impossible for those countries to handle. So because of this very reason, international, the international community is very, very much invested in what happens in Nigeria. They want there to be peace. They want Nigerians to be safe in their own country. As such, we've had a lot of embassies write in support of NSAS, in support of the dignity of Nigerian citizens, saying that the Nigerian government must listen to its citizens. That's one. We've had international brands like Flutterwave, like Twitter, also share in their support for what is happening in Nigeria. You will uh, agree with me that the morning that Jack Dorsey of Twitter tweeted in support of Feminist School, in support of NSAS, that the support for NSAS grew exponentially that very day. When he also tweeted that these are the platforms where they could contribute money to in support for NSAS, you know, they recorded a high number of contributions. So yes, definitely, uh, foreign governments may not come out tacitly to support what is going on, but I tell you, they know that the fight for the dignity of Nigerian citizens is a fight that they must be part of. It's a fight that they must support. But what was the Nigerian government response to them? Because it's an internal matter and uh, the foreign countries is like uh, talking about something because they, they should go and deal with their own internal problems. Why focusing on Nigeria? Okay, Even though I'll, President I'll, I'll, Muhammad Bo in his uh, speech, you also ask them uh, to mind their businesses too. Uh, Nigeria as an entity is part of the international community. So uh, Geoffrey Onyema, who is the Nigerian Minister of Foreign Affairs, had to rally around ambassadors in Nigeria to explain to them what was going on, to also explain to them what the government was doing in response to the protests around the country. That's one. There was another visiting delegation from the United States Department of State that met with uh, Vice President Osibanjo, and they told him that the protection and dignity of Nigerian citizens was should be a priority. But in all, you heard what the president said in his broadcast, where he said that the international community must and first understand what is going on before they analyze or before they make points about uh, the, the, the protest, which I think uh, was an unfair statement to our allies and the international community, because indeed they have a very, very great understanding of what is going on in Nigeria. So I think it was unfair for the president to have said this because this, these are our biggest allies and they are our biggest supporters. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. al -Kassim. We'll also get back to you again. Uh, Mr. Aliyu. Now, yes. <clears throat> yes, uh, something uh, our viewers would like to know is, did the president or President Muhammad Buhari's opponent support the demonstration because well, some people are seeing it from the political angle, uh, something like uh, the protesters were incited by the oppositions in the country. Well, uh, I, there were many claims that uh, uh, there were political interference in the protest and the many were saying uh, the opponents of the uh, President Muhammad Buhari were those who are pushing the protesters to demand more, to demand more, even though uh, their first demand uh, were, their first demand was uh, actually acknowledged and uh, granted. Uh, but uh, you can't say uh, there is, uh, oh, there was uh, 
an obvious hands of political opponents uh, of my in the protest because uh, some politicians who tried to hijack the protest uh, were actually uh, sent away by the protesters, uh, like uh, the Nigerian activist and the politician Omoe Leshore uh, was actually uh, uh, sent away when he was trying to uh, to bring his own uh, revolution now struggle into the protest, and there there was. Uh, uh, there was uh, uh, Reno Omokri who also tried to, uh, you know, join the protest uh, online, but he was also uh, actually uh, uh, asked to go back because uh, the protest was not meant to be uh, political. So I think what made what made the the protest uh, very strong was uh, the absence of political hands in it. Uh, even though there were many claims, uh, especially from the supporters of Muhammadu Buhari, that his opponents were trying to, you know, trample or trample his uh, uh, his seat and make Nigeria ungovernable because they couldn't win election, but we couldn't notice any uh, obvious, obvious or any uh, visible uh, political political hands in the protests. Okay, th thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Iguegu, over to you again. Uh, what are the possible political consequences of the protest? Yeah, so to so connect with what you know the last speaker just said, yes, um, there have been accusations, 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 but the fact remains this still remains a people driven and people oriented struggle. Right? This is this is coming from dissatisfaction with with governance, not with the politics of, of Nigeria, not with the parties, you know, whether opposition or in, in government. This is clear this is clearly you know apolitical in that dimension. At the same time, you know, you can it would be naive to to say this is not political. This is political in the sense that you know uh, democracy is, is is a political you know game. You know we we as citizens have our own role to play and responsible citizenship starts with res with holding your government accountable and responsible for its action or inaction or malign act action. And in this in this regard, the youth. In fact, if you look at the demographics of Nigeria, there's a youth bulge, right? And that youth bulge, you know, are like uh, the, uh, one of the guests here said, you know, with median age is 18. That tells you that this is largely a youth country or a very young country in, in a sense. And what we are seeing now is that they, are, they have come of age politically. They now understand that they have power to challenge and change or elect any government that they want or they, they do not want. They can, they can also still, you know, kick them out of office. But in this case, the overall goal of this protest is not politics, but a change in police behavior. Yes, it may be driven with by frustration of you know yes police brutality and other uh, you know uh, issues under the surface like you know unemployment which is sky high. We have unemployment and unemployment in this country is about fifty five percent according to the National Bureau of Statistics. That if you combine both unemployed and underemployed you know population together, you know there is the issue of hunger and poverty in in the land. All of this is adding to the frustration, but primarily the goal of this protest. It's in the name of the protest, end SARS, and the, the, the associate, you know, uh, slogans like police, end police brutality, you know, police reforms and all of that. So this, the political consequences of, of this now is that the youth have realized their power and they know that they can actually compel government to take action by exercising that power. And come 2023, I believe there will be a huge youth participation you know, in the political process. So many people who are 16, 17, 17 today will, will be 18 by that by that time. So you're going to have more of the, you know, the youth pop uh, population, the young population entering into the political system. And I I see them really exercising that power, you know, to choose leadership that they feel will, be, will listen to them, that they, will not, they don't feel they have to beg to address them. They don't feel that they, they cannot, you know, talk to or hold, hold to account. So nationally, that's, that's the, the political dynamic. Also, even in Lagos, 
you know, there are certain power structures there that thought they can never be challenged. But now people are challenging them and really pointing fingers at them and saying, you ought to do better. You are not supposed to act like this or give that order and, and or, or, uh, you know, that, you know, that many people have never seen in this country for, for some years now that certain people cannot be challenged or certain structures cannot be challenged. Enough but, of that, and that, that has come to do, an end. Uh, during 2019 elections, or prior to that, we had the not too long to run bills passed in the National Assembly. Do you think yeah. if the youths, very young, like you, joined the active politics, can the youth change the situation in Nigeria? Definitely, the youth, the youth can, because if it... See the problem. The problem you have to understand with the dynamics, and I think everybody here would, would share the sentiment, is that it's it's very challenging to actually rely on on the election themselves to, to to change leadership because we know they are, they are, they are largely there's huge huge you know electoral misconduct, right? So even if we are even targeting the, the the election as a way to actually exercise you know that our uh, mandate to the ability to change government. It has to be overwhelming, right? So having a young too young to run was just like a first step. 2023 is going to be like the dry run where it's, it's, that will be tested because that happened really close to you know 2019 election. 2023, all the mobilization and all the momentum that has been built, you know, with this current uh, protest will be exercised come 2020, 2023. So I think uh, I'm optimistic and I'm hopeful and I feel that is very possible that the youth can really make uh, you know make happen what they so choose in, is in their best interest come 2023 thank you very much and uh, i share you so we, we are back to you again uh, what is what what is your message your last message to to the protesters my last message to the protesters is that like they say we move and that they should understand that this is a uh, this is a marathon not a sprint they have done so well. They have gotten their voices. The Nigerian youth that were once called lazy will never be called lazy again. The Nigerian youth that we thought cannot do anything have shown the world that indeed they're capable. They're capable. They are not leaders of tomorrow. They are leaders of today. And I said to them, use that to go on. Strategize. Keep doing the right thing. Have integrity. Have character. Have competence. Have capacity. Work on all of that. That indeed Nigeria of our dream, where there's dignity, it's possible. And you've shown us the way. And for me, I'm in awe of what the Nigerian youth have shown. And I'm so sorry that my generation didn't do enough to give you a Nigeria that you should be proud of. But at the end of the day, the beautiful thing you did was brought in, mayhem was brought into it, but never, ever give up. That's my message. Thank you. On the social media, we have seen one of your pictures raising hand like that. Yeah. <laughs> being shown, being shown, as I, how did you feel with that? You know, when, when I'm asked that question, I really don't feel anything because I've, I've done that numerous times. That's what I do all the time. I will stand. And, you know, I look back at myself. I'm like, okay, Aisha, I'm going to have a talk with you because at that moment, I thought at any time I was going to get a bullet. And after we left, after that particular moment, the, even the hardest one was when they actually threw the chair gas. Everybody had run. I refused to run. I was walking away with my hand high up. Although those pictures didn't co haven't come out yet. The person, one person I know who had them probably hasn't shared them. And the police were shooting tear gas canister and live bullets at me. Till this moment, I don't know how I, it happened that I was, not, I was not hit. But the thing is that one thing I always say is the fact that the day that we do not speak against injustice because we are afraid to die is the day that we truly die. So I, I, I'm so glad that people found motivation in that and courage in that. But we've been on the street for so long. Uh, for me, it's something I always normally would do. I'm glad that people found courage to keep going. And like I said earlier, we move. Okay, and uh, uh, there is something I would like to ask again. What is your source of courage? Uh, so so I, I've been asked this question all the time. This is who I am. This is how I've always been born. Even as a child, it got me into lots of trouble because coming from a, a society where children are not supposed to question adults, they are not supposed to ask why. And I will always stand against injustice, no matter wherever it was. I but mean, one of the things that I found so late in, and as I grew up, I, I, it dawned on me was the fact that when, when people had issues and they wanted that truth to be said, 
they will still come back to you. And for me, uh, I was less than 10 when I said to myself that the worst thing any human being can do to me is to kill me and that I'm going to die anyway. So it's not really the worst thing. I'm a Muslim and I know at every second I, I, I'm going to die. So I live my life to the fullest. And for me, fight against is injustice is what it's supposed to be. I, I can't be quiet. I can't be silent. During the 2014 or uh, during the protest against or during the Bring Back Our Girls campaign, you were with another woman and mm -hmm. later they joined the government and kept quiet. And people are saying maybe if a juicy position is offered to Aisha Yusufu, she may have also kept quiet. What can you say to refute such statements? So the first thing I'm going to say, and I think uh, when people talk about this, they talk about Hadiza Bala Usman. And I think it's very wrong for people to look look at it from that angle. She wasn't given the position she has because she's a big Rebecca Agress guest member. She was given the position she had because she has competence, character, and capacity, and she's a politician. So she was a politician who in 2014 decided to show empathy. And we must get to a stage whereby we are comfortable with the fact that our politicians also show empathy. So she got, she she was in, uh, what do you call this thing, a CPC. She had run for a house of rep, I think, before then. So it was normally what they what they do. So it's not as if because of BPOG. For me personally, I've, I've, I've never worked in my life. I'm, I'm a businesswoman and I've never done any work and I have no intention of working for anyone. So in terms of whether position or not, Aisha is, is not the one. That, that that wants to do that i love being accountable to myself i like to do what i want to do how i want to do it and when i want to do it and i don't see myself being accountable to anyone to now come and be uh, running for an office or uh, running or being uh an employee or something or an appointee so people should should do that you know like you did mention uh, uh, uh if, as, if asked if asked to come and uh, be given an office will you Absolutely not. Aisha is cool. Not. I've said this in several days. I said I've never worked in my life. So why am I, I will, where am I going to start? I'm 46, about to turn 47 in December. Then how can so you bring about the, ch the change the change Nigerian youth are yearning for? By being on the demand side. So there are, uh, in the words of Dr. Obiezo Kessili, there are two sides of governance, the demand side and the supply side. And most people think that for us to make changes in government that we have to be in the supply side. No. You can make change in the demand side. And I think that is where Nigerians have been missing. We vote people into office and then we don't hold them accountable. So I, I share it. So I'm part of the demand side where we'll hold people who are in government or whoever is, uh, has a, a position accountable for them to give us good governance, accountability, and transparency. And I'm perfectly okay uh, in that side of governance. Thank, thank you very much for your contribution. Mr. al uh, quickly. Uh, how can you rate the support of uh, the diaspora, the Nigerians in diaspora support to the to the protest, to the NSARS protest? Did oh, they do the enough? Nigerians in diaspora are doing mm. are doing amazingly well. I mean, day before yesterday, I saw a picture of a vigil in Bali, Indonesia. Bali, Indonesia is thousands and thousands of miles away from Abuja or Lagos. If Nigerians in Bali, Indonesia can come together and hold a candlelight vigil in, in support of NSAS, I think this message has become a globalized message. Nigerians in Washington, D.C., Nigerians in New York, Nigerians in London, Nigerians in Berlin, Nigerians all over have risen in support of NSAS. They have put their money where their mouth is. They continue to support the, 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 what is going on in, in, in Nigeria. Uh, like a lot of Nigerians say, Nigerians in diaspora are now holding forth. They are now flying the flag of the NSAS protest. If us in Nigeria can't come out on the streets because we're going to get shot, they live in highly civilized and democratized societies and they're free to do to protest as they want. I think it's in London whereby somebody tried to disrupt the protest and the police arrested him. The police actually arrested him. We saw his picture being pinned to the ground. So they don't have the police shooting at them. They have the police arresting those who are going to disrupt them. So I say great job to Nigerians in diaspora. We need this more in the coming days and months and years. We need their support because they are going to help us amplify the message. They are going to help us globalize the, globalize the message because 
this is a global message. We need to take back our country. We need to have a better country. And we're very grateful that they are in full support of what is going on. The time has passed whereby Nigerians in diaspora just face their business, just paid their taxes and lived as good citizens in the countries where they were. We're very, very happy that uh, they're taking a very strong interest in what is happening here. I remember uh, a protest in, in, in Texas last, last, uh, last week whereby a young woman said, I'm here for the protest because we go home, we, bo we go back home in December. And when we go back home in December, we face police harassment. So you can take the Nigerian out of Nigeria, but you cannot take Nigeria out of wherever you are. Very much I'm done. Yes, Mr. Moderator, I've made my point. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Mr. Ali Utahiru Ali. Hello. Uh, sorry, Mr. Uh, Mohammed, uh, Mr. Ali, I think I have gone. Uh, you had a, a technical problem, I think. He is not here now. Abu Bakir Yahya, can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, uh, Mr. Ali, you have gone. He is not here now. I think uh, he had a technical problem. How about that? Uh, he had gone. Okay, then uh, let's move to Mr. Eguegu. Mr. Eguegu, can you hear me? Very well. Recently, in some West African countries, we witnessed what happened to the government then. Do you think if the protest continues, something like that may happen in Nigeria? Yes and no. No, in the, in the, sen in the sense that, you know, as, uh, the protest has a very specific, you know, goal that is very clear for everybody to see, which is answers. And if you look, if you look at the, you know, the demands that have been put forward by, by the protesters, it's all been very clear. There is no part of it that says topple the government or topple the regime or, you know, uh, what you've seen in places like, like Mali re recently. So it's very clear. It's very focused. And, you know, um, that, that's not in the agenda, right? However, you know, we, we, have to, we have to be very pragmatic because, you know, when you have so much strife, when you have so much agitation, so much frustration with governance, and, 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 you know, um, the, the economy, in terms of how they're managing the economy, in the soci socioeconomic situation, you know, and all, and all of that. Yes, of course, there is a tendency for, you know, there's a tendency for this you know, to spill over or to be uh, capitalized on by whether, you know, internal or external forces that might want to carry out, you know, some form of... Uh, change of, of, of government. But as it is now, the protest still remains very focused on the initial goal and objectives, which is change you know, the, the, you know, the, the, the brutal, uh, police brutality, you know, change you know, the attitude towards po policing, the policing culture, you know, have uh, uh, you know, uh, trials of those who have been, you know, who, who have been accused of you know police you know criminality and all the, the judicial killing and all of that, so everything still remains within the NSAS you know uh, uh, movement as police brutality being the major major you know motivation and the, you know the the agenda is police reform. Nothing whatsoever has you know uh, been said about you know 
uh, do away with the with the government or or you know uh, as it were no. But the president was saying that uh, they will not allow any activity that may truncate Nigeria's democracy. How did you understand such a statement from President Muhammad? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, 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 yes, I was baffled when he said that because ex the, whatever is going on in the country right now is and has always been an exercise of democracy itself. So truncating the Nigeria's democracy. You know, now sounds as if we are talking about a, a different reality. The reality on the ground is that you've got thousands of Nigerians on the streets who are dissatisfied with the, with the policing culture, and then they are holding, they are trying to hold their government to account. That is democracy being exercised in 3D. It's not, you know, we're, we're not, we, we, we don't have the likes of uh, the Niger Delta militancy. The youth are not arming themselves to say, do this for us, or else we'll, we'll start, you know, blowing up pipelines or start damaging. Government, government properties. No, what you have is people coming out in this, in, in, in on the street with to exercise their constitutional rights to you know to express their, griev their grievances. And if you look at and let me tell you, you will find that on the streets of nine, in, 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 particularly last week, you had three types of people on the street. You had the legitimate NSAS protesters who I would say are you know young edu educated and aware of police police brutality leading and calling for change then you had you know a, 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 a another group of people who are frustrated and who are not buying into the peace, peaceful protest mantra of the first group of protesters protesters and then those are the people you you would find on social media you know, there, there are videos of people you know destroying properties you know uh, attacking policemen and, and all of that. Those then there's a third group th that were really, really out to exploit the unrest to carry out criminal activities. Please understand th these are three distinct, you know, uh, people on the street, particularly last week. But what we have seen from the government is that they've conflated all these three together. They are they are acting as if they don't know that those in Lekki have been peaceful thus far. They are trying to act as if they don't understand what is happening in Lekki is different from the criminalities we're seeing in other parts of the country. And that in and of itself is a betrayal of trust and yeah, a, but the kind they of said that willful ignorance that shouldn't be tolerated. And the, the, the 81 division of the Nigerian army also said they were invited by the Lagos state government and they didn't fire shots at anyone at Lekki. Oh yeah, I mean the, the army can say you know uh, what what it 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 wants to say to avoid culpability. So, but uh, there are there are videos that are very very clear for no, everyone. They said know, they, they are fake. The videos live... were doctored. Yeah, exactly. They, said, uh, they are fake that's videos. What, that's what we're, we're, we've been hearing. Yes, yes. And like I said, anybody is free to say what they want to say. But I don't think it is possible anywhere in the world, not in the, the most technologically advanced countries that you can doctor a live feed. On the 20th of October, 2020, at the Lekki Togate, there was an account by, called DJ Switch that was streaming the activities of the protest live on for uh, the whole world to see. And all of the actions and all of the voices you could hear there was the army, the army is shooting, the army is mobilizing, people are dying. And those that live feed cannot be doctored. You can doctor photos, you can edit videos and cut clips out of it, but a live feed, there is no way on earth that it is possible given the technological tools available. Not not, not of Nigerian youths. You know, we yes, we are talented, we are gifted, but I don't think we have the ability to doctor a live feed. That is just escapism. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. And uh, with this, we came to the end of our webinar today about end SARS protest in Nigeria. And uh, I would like our director, Dr. Ismail Solemes, to say one or two things as a closer remarks. Uh, sorry for uh, sound. Uh, first, uh, uh, thank you to all participants. Uh, we talked about the SARS protests in Nigeria on uh, tonight's uh, program. I would like to thank all participants. Uh, we wish a more peaceful Nigeria, neither 
no problem for Nigerian people or for Nigerian government because Nigerian uh, is a friendly country uh, to us. I wish everyone uh, a good evening. Also, thank our esteemed moderator, Abu Yahya. Thank you so much. Also, thank you very much. to our program coordinator, Mr. Kalan Toprak. Uh, I think uh, that's a very, very uh, good job. Uh, thank you uh, all. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. And we would like Thank to have you again for me. Uh, on another topic. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you so yeah. much for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Love you. Well. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Thank you.